Yorokoto. Namihiki Itengi. Mimihiko to Kato. Ko Ruepehu Te Maunga. Ko Honganui Te Awa. No Natitakia Aho. Ko Rosemary Pinwooden Aho. I was born in February 1959, a year before Bill. I, I'm not going to pull rank, though. <laughs> it's right after they began measuring those parts per million of atmospheric CO2 at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. So I was born at 316.38 parts per million. So last month, I think it was about 410. It's about 30% rise. Uh, this is a photo of me uh, on the front desk, scowling under the sun. Uh, it's not the whole family, though. My little brother hasn't been born yet. Uh, it's about 1961 or 62. Uh, Mum specialised in making up clothes and cutting hair. <laughs> Matching hairstyles. We grew up on a small dairy farm near Whanganui. I learned to drive the tractor, change tyres, Dig spud, milk cows, shovel their shit. I learned how to skin possums. But I didn't really learn very well how to say no. I guess when you've got seven children, you've got to regiment them. And I didn't really learn self-confidence when I was young. At 22, I kissed mum and dad goodbye, took off on my OE. I missed the Springbok tour which I think was probably quite a good thing for family relations because I found out recently that um, it was my brother-in-law's best friend who beat up John Minto at Rugby Park in Hamilton. When Bill published The End of Nature, I was back home. I'd moved to Dunedin, which is my home now. I had one kid and a, another one on the way. Uh, we were right in the midst, right in the throes of the neoliberal New Zealand experiment. Uh, went through the unemployment stuff. I also got myself a job, got myself qualified as a medical laboratory scientist where I worked at Dunedin Hospital, uh, doing far too many actually dangerous hours with not enough staff. It's all fairly familiar now, isn't it? Um, my brother also worked for the government at that time, and he said, Rose, we'll look back and laugh at this rubbish they're trying to change in our lives. But it didn't really work out that way, and I must say that even though climate change was a growing worry, it hadn't really re reached my list of most important things at that time. And, and I have to join the dots either, like, all that greed and push for growth at the cost of our decent treatment of each other, it, it was the time that those global emissions were just racing up. In 2011, three things happened. This little guy, <laughs> excuse me, I get a bit emotional. This little guy came into the world. He's a couple of days old in this picture and I'm absolutely smitten. Um, the same year, Jim Hansen came to the Netherlands and confirmed all my fears about climate change. And Jeanette Fitzsimons, ex-party, ex-Green Party co-leader, gave a talk about our state coal company's plans for the Matara Valley in Southland and um, digging up the lignite there, which would have increased New Zealand's carbon emissions by around 20% if we'd let them. We didn't. <laughs> and those people... <laughs> people who know Jeanette will know what I mean when I say she's a walking encyclopedia. But it wasn't her facts and figures that struck me that night when she spoke um, at Otago University. It was at the end of her talk when she said, this is what I'll be doing for the rest of my life. I, honestly, I felt a physical jolt. And I knew that's what I'd be doing too. 
we've actually been working together since then on coal and lots of other things. So that was the start of how my life is now. Uh, my partner Derek and I haven't got a mortgage left and over the years we've organised things quite deliberately so that we don't need much money and I can spend lots of time doing the things that really, really matter. And I sort of could divide it all into three bits. The stuff I do for myself, which one of them is, I wrote about the other day that I've stopped flying, I just don't want to anymore. Um, then there's stuff that I do with others, building things up, like we've got this place called the Valley Workspace in, in Dunedin where we're converting electric cars and electric bikes and um, doing some really cool stuff together, sharing resources. There's a one end that's full of geeky people doing things with 3D printers. Uh, but I want to save most of my talk for the third part, which is what Will's been talking about, keeping it in the ground. This is the hardest. And as Will said, we've left it so long. It is urgent now. We're in a race. We're in a race against time. And also, this is the work we can't do alone as individuals. And so my most important work is with groups like 350. And here's where I say, I just want you to imagine the stage full of people. Because I can, it's not just me. Imagine it filled with lots and lots of young people. Um, not all young, there's a great grandma. I think she's in the audience tonight. Um, and to meet a recently uh, retired Dominican nun has joined us. We've got an ex um, Presbyterian minister as well in the group. And I, and I want to say, just imagine along the front, uh, Māori and Indigenous Pacifica people. Climate breakdown, of course, it doesn't affect us all evenly. And I think these are the most effective people and they need to be at the front and they need to teach us the way. And I feel that they're already so far ahead of us because they already know how to live and work collectively. Uh, we've had some wins in Dunedin. We joined in with some worldwide campaign. And I'll tell you just a few of them. Um, I'll just go through them. This was, oh wow, this was way back in 2012. We had this elephant invited to Shell's first, and as it happened, only Dunedin. Um, what did they call it? They called it the um, Dunedin Community Engagement Workshop. It was invitation only, so we had Ellie, the elephant, invited. She sat there right in the middle with climate change on her back. And she really did behave herself, she didn't say a word. But some people, and I'm not saying it was me, didn't behave themselves. And actually that meeting got shut down and we got international, international attention for that. Shall have never held an open meeting like that in Dunedin since. In fact, Shell have left the Great South Basin. But one thing that happened after this meeting was that we made our mayor quite grumpy. He'd, he'd been in a small video a few years earlier inviting oil companies to make Dunedin their base. Um, imagine Dunedin, the Aberdeen of the South instead of the Edinburgh of the South. So we begun a campaign and we felt the mayor was quite an important person in that campaign. Well, we really blew it with the elephant, but never mind. We worked on him and we showered him with love. And this is a picture of my friend Annabeth delivering our, our logo is the albatross. So we had the octagon absolutely covered with albatrosses. And this is my friend Annabeth delivering giant sized Valentine's Day cards to the City Council. Dunedin City Council, we love you, but we'll love you more 
when you divest from fossil fuels. <laughs> it took persistence, but in a nail-biting majority of one vote, Dunedin became the first New Zealand city to divest from fossil fuels. Thank you. Um, we also started Block the Offer campaign, and this was in response to the government's block offers where they invited the oil companies to, you know, take our land, take our sea, put in the highest bid. Um, it, this was a day, you can't really tell from the photo, but we'd designed this banner to fit perfectly between the two tallest trees on the, on the university campus. But it was like horizontal sleep that day, and it was about two degrees. The banner ripped straight away, so we ended up draping it over the bridge. Actually, it stayed there all day, and it looked, looked okay. It was pretty good. The Block the Offer campaign is, hmm, I don't know if it'll go this year, now that we don't have any new deep sea drilling. But it was taken up by groups all around New Zealand, and it was, it was a great way to lobby our councils. Oh, I've got to read this. Here's what our mayor, the same mayor that invited the oil companies, probably seven years earlier. This is what he said last year. The world is waking up. We cannot identify benefits of exploring for oil off our coast. We don't have any kind of right to trade in our grandkids' futures for a few pieces of silver now. Um, he, he doesn't know it yet, but we haven't quite finished with him. <laughs> we, we have noticed there are certain relationships with certain fossil fuel companies and the council that we need to discuss. <laughs> the ANZ. So this is way back in 2015, that's my friend Charlie and I. We had to bundle that banner up into Charlie's coat and walk into the bank and open it up. This was a nationwide 350 uh, campaign to get the ANZ to stop funding the New Zealand Petroleum Summit, which they did the following year, which was great. Uh, the following year, I haven't got the photo, any photos, unfortunately, but we took part in a great free year of action, a week of action, all around the world, it kind of didn't go so well in Dunedin. We, um, we sat in front of three ANZ banks and the police in Dunedin decided, hmm, we're going to encourage bank customers to walk on these people, which they did. Uh, we got a, quite a bit of bad press. Um, it was a very interesting day, but the, the really interesting, most interesting thing about that was a few months later, I think it was that action outside the ANZ bank that pushed our university, which we'd been also working on for mm, three years at least, uh, to divest. This is my favourite photograph of our university with a fossil-free logo light show right at the top. Yeah. Um, I think the last thing they wanted was 150 people to sit in front of their registry office. So that might have been the push that got them over. Last thing we would have thought of at the time. I've, um, oh yeah, we haven't finished with the ANZ either. They are still the biggest funder of fossil fuel projects in the South Pacific. Uh, but we did go back the following year and reminded them, and I wish I had the picture to show you, but I don't. Um, we reminded them that we were never, never, never going to give them up until they gave up on fossil fuels with a bit of rick rolling inside the bank. And a beautiful banner, and we quite like banners in Dunedin. Another beautiful banner hanging over the top of the building. This is just a reminder that everything we do as a growing movement has an effect. We don't always know how big and we don't always know what it's going to be, but every campaign, every letter, every delegation to council, every blockade or protest or banner drop, even every bit of baking to sell at the information store is a step in the right direction. 
And it might just be the one thing, probably not the backing, but it might just be the one thing that tips us over into that movement that is big and bulgy enough to save us. My granddaughter has just turned one, and that was her at the very, very start. She was, um, she, she loves just holding my finger and walking along. And a couple of weeks ago, she let go, let go of my finger and just looked at me with so much pride, but wasn't quite ready, you know, to take that step. And um, then, last week, her brother, Arlo, who's six now, rang me up and said, she's off. Nama. She even took a sideways step. <laughs> and this is a picture of her walking. <laughs> very proud, very proud grandma. And these two continue to be my main inspiration. It was that balance, getting that balance, that was her tipping point. And I feel, I feel him. We're getting close to that balance, to that tipping point in the climate movement here in Aotearoa. Having a government on our side is a strange and wonderful thing. I'm not used to it, I still have to push myself. Banning deep sea drilling is huge. Of course, in our part of the country, we still have current permits, so those companies could still come here. We're going to remind them next week that they might as well not bother because even if our government won't stop them, we will. Right. But I personally can't quite trust the government either. And I mean, they're politicians, right? We, we can't sit back. We can't leave it to them. I'm, I hope I've got time to tell you my dream. Do you think I've got time? Okay, here's my dream. <laughs> It's to everybody my age. Um, you don't have to be my age, but if you've paid off your mortgage, got a comfortable home, got a reasonably comfortable place to live, that you take five years out, five years, and come and join us. There isn't anything more urgent right now than this. Not the next overseas trip. Not, not, not that deck, deck on the front of the house, not that new room at the back. No, what's urgent is for us to organise into an unstoppable force. I reckon we can do it. I reckon we can do it. We've got to dismantle the fossil fuel industry. But by that, we've got to just slip that rug out from underneath them. We've got to collectively and forcefully, and I've been learning this to say no really loudly. We've got to take our money out of the banks. We've been doing that. We've got to take away their investors. We've got to refuse their offers of funding and sponsoring our kids' sports teams, our students' master's projects, our surf lifesavers. We have to take their social license absolutely completely away. Would you? support the fossil fuel industry, no. not the fossil, would you support the tobacco industry doing that? Well, we can't, we can't support the fossil fuel industry in any way. I think Bill's going to talk about that a bit more. And, oh, in my dream, <laughs> with proper training, we will learn, we will all learn how to peacefully resist the things that we have to stop. It might take at the right time, it might take marching together into a coal mine. It might take jumping in front of a drill ship. It might take occupying a certain head office. No names mentioned tonight, but if you're a fossil fuel company, watch out. Our tools and tactics are as varied as our imagination, and our skills are varied, and they're useful. They're all useful. In fact, if you're a mum, or you've ever been a mum, probably a dad too, but I haven't experienced of that, You've got exactly the right skills to be a climate activist. Patience, long periods without sleep, endurance, dogged determination, good deduction skills, the ability to keep one step ahead of your opponent. I said earlier that I didn't learn self-confidence when I was young, 
Well, I get that now from the young people I work with in the climate movement. I get my courage from them. I've never felt so powerful as when I'm linking arms with those who care as much as I do. The most meaningful day for me was when I was linking arms with the people of Parihaka to stop oil executives getting into their conference in New Plymouth. As a grandma, I can't think of a more useful place to be than on the front lines of stopping the fossil fuel industry in my part of the world. And something odd has happened. At 59, I feel stronger and I don't know if I can say happy, but happier in a very holistic way than I've ever felt in my life. Which is kind of weird because this climate change stuff is incredibly scary. I think it has something to do with what you said, Bill, a few years ago. Very few people on this earth ever get to say, I'm doing right now the most important thing I could possibly be doing. If you'll join this fight, that's what you'll get to say. Tēnā koutou.